Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Marla Turner. I'm the board president of Emerge Nevada. Uh, my privilege to welcome you all here today to our webinar uh, from Emerge America. We um, are delighted to have the next couple of speakers that are going to be presenting to us. Before we get started, I have a couple of little housekeeping items to go through. I know a number of people are also going to be joining us, but we uh, have a capacity audience for this webinar, which is not surprising considering the uh, caliber of our guests. Um, so uh, I'm sure a number of us will have questions throughout the presentation. If you would uh, look at the towards the bottom of your screen, you'll find a little uh, uh, button there that says Q&A. You can submit your questions in that box uh, throughout the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. And uh, that way we're not likely to forget them or whatever, you can go ahead and get your question in. Because we have that full capacity, we uh, most likely will not be able to answer everybody's questions, but we will certainly do the very best that we can. Uh, so uh, today's guests, of course, are Dr. Jennifer Laalis and Dr. Richard Fox. Uh, who are here to talk to us about their uh, most recent research on young people in politics uh, from their book titled Running from Office, Why Young Americans Are Turned Off to Politics. And so uh, I'd like to, um, I won't go through all of their bios because we'd be here till next week. Uh, very impressive for both of them. Dr. Lawless is a professor of government. Uh, and director of the Women and Politics Institute at American University in Washington. She received her bachelor's degree in political science from Union College in New York, and both her master's and PhD in political science from Stanford in California. She is a nationally recognized expert on women and politics, an author or co-author of a number of books, which we'll hear about shortly. Her research focuses on gender, political ambition, campaigns and elections in the United States. Uh, her work has appeared in nearly two dozen uh, peer-reviewed academic journals, uh, which is particularly impressive to me, uh, working from the clinical perspective. She has issued several policy reports on the barriers that impede women's uh, candidate emergence, and given hundreds and hundreds of lectures and presentations on women in politics. Dr. Richard Fox is a professor of political science at Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles. After graduating from Claremont, uh, Claremont McKenna College, he earned his master's and PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Prior to coming to Loyola Marymount, he was professor and chair at, in the, the political science department at Union College in New York. His teaching and research uh, work focuses on the areas of the United States Congress, elections, media, and politics and gender politics. His work has appeared in such journals as Political Psychology, The Journal of Politics, American Journal of Political Science, Social Problems, PS, and Politics and Gender. He has also written op-ed articles, some of which have appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Together, they have co-authored three books and on their own have written uh, books uh, on their own. I just said that. They have written additional books on their own. We are very fortunate to have such esteemed uh, guests today. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Please help me welcome uh, Dr. Lawless and Dr. Fox. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, so oh, sorry. What we are going to do is split this presentation in half. I'm going to summarize the basic finding about young people's interest in running for office and provide one of the three explanations we come up with for why young Americans are turned off to politics. I'll then turn it over to Richard. He'll provide information on the other two explanations, as well as some suggestions about how we might chart a new course and change what's happening. So maybe the best way to begin is to just recap how disgusted the American public actually is with the federal government and Congress in particular. If we look over the course of the last 12 or 13 years, we see that congressional approval and trust in the government to do what's right has gone down. Often it's in the single digits. 
people could not be more turned off by and disgusted by the dysfunction, the obstructionism, and the inability to get anything done that they regularly see on Capitol Hill. In fact, when we ask people in polls nationally about the relative popularity of the US Congress versus other very unpopular things, we see that things like lice, Brussels sprouts, traffic jams actually rank higher than the US Congress. So obviously, these are sort of cute, funny little polling questions, but they really do demonstrate that it's difficult for people to hold members of Congress or elected officials or the federal government in any kind of high regard. And we were particularly concerned about this because we think that there are implications for the next generation. So Specifically, there's a lot of research that suggests that high school and college students' career goals are actually very good predictors of their occupations later in life. In fact, one of the things that we've seen is that what you say you're interested in being when you're 16 or 17 years old maps pretty well onto the career you ultimately pursue, or at least the careers you think about pursuing. And so we thought that if young people are turned off to politics, if they only see this inefficiency, obstructionism, gridlock, stalemate, then if it's not occurring to them that running for office later in life is something that they might want to do now, it's unlikely that it's going to occur to them later. In order to determine whether that's actually the case, we conducted a national poll of 13 to 17 year olds and 18 to 25 year olds. Right around the 2012 election, we were able to sample and survey a national random sample of young Americans. We did this with the help of GFK Custom Research. And ultimately, we have survey data from about 2,163 high school students and more than 2,100 full-time college students. So this allowed us to ask them generally what their attitudes toward government were, what their career interests later in life were, what their political experiences and political interests were, and whether they had ever considered running for office. And we supplemented the survey results with 115 in-depth phone interviews with these respondents the following summer. And so the data that we're going to present over the course of the next 20 minutes or so come primarily from the survey, but we will supplement them with some of the specific quotes that we were able to glean from the interviews that we conducted with these 13 to 25 year olds. So the best place to begin is just very simply young people's interest in running for office. So the first question that we have here on the left-hand panel is, have you ever thought that someday when you're older, you might want to run for a political office? It could be any political office. And what we see are that only 11% of 13 to 25 year olds said, yeah, I thought about that many times. 61% had never considered it at all. The rest fell in the middle um, where they thought about it once or twice, but not with any degree of serious thought. So what we see here on this left-hand panel is that 89% of young Americans have not thought with any degree of consistency that running for office is something that they might want to do. We then asked, even if you've never thought about it, could you see yourself one day running for office? And there the numbers are just as bad. Only 7% said yes, definitely they could envision that. 29% said no. And the rest fell in the middle, but again, the overwhelming majority of those responses fall far closer to the no, I'd never run than the yes, I would definitely run. This wasn't the only way we asked this question, though. We also asked them to think about political offices relative to other careers and what might they be most interested in pursuing. So if you look at this slide, this is just a summary of the data about young people's attitudes toward being a mayor of a town. So at the top, we see the answers to the question, if all of the following jobs paid the same amount of money, which would you most like to be? 50% said business owner, 35% said teacher, only 10% said mayor of a city or town. That fared better than salesperson, but not by much. And then if we look at of all of those same jobs, which would you least like to be? Again, mayor of a city or town was the second most popular option here, right, along with salesperson. So people are less likely to favor mayor of a city or town over business and teacher, and they're more likely to say it's something that they would not like to do. We asked a similar question about running for Congress and serving in the Congress, and we compared that to other higher echelon jobs. And we see the same pattern, except it's actually a little bit worse. If all of the following jobs pay the same amount of money, which would you most like to be? Business executive, school principal, and lawyer all did far better than member of Congress. And when we look at the least likely preferences, we see that member of Congress wins. 
So whether we're talking about local level positions or federal offices, these results are very consistent with the idea that young people are not interested in running for office. Another way that we can get at this is by asking young people about their goals for the future. So we provided them with a series of goals and asked them which were important to them, which were things that they wanted to pursue. And as we see in this figure, the responses are not that surprising. Almost all of them said that they wanted to achieve professional success. Nine out of 10 wanted to buy a house. They wanna earn a lot of money. They wanna get married and have children. Of all of the goals that we provided, becoming a political leader or running for office was the least important to everyone. It was even lower than becoming famous, which is not something that most of these kids are going to actually be. And so again, regardless of whether we ask in general, regardless of whether we pit political professions against other professions, or we ask generally about goals for the future, running for office and being a political leader does not appeal to young people in this day and age. And we found the same thing to be true in our interviews. When we ask just generally, what do you wanna be when you grow up? How would you feel about being a politician? And I just wanna give you a very um, small sample of the quotes and the responses that we heard from these kids. Charlotte, a high school junior said, people in politics, they're squirrely. They say they're going to do something, but they don't do it. I don't wanna be part of that. Another example, I'm going into farming. Politics is for people who like to bang their heads against the wall. I'd rather milk cows than run for office. Finally, by the time you're done with politics, your hair has turned gray. I wanna keep my hair not gray. I don't even wanna think about a career in politics. So the survey data and the interview evidence paint a pretty damning picture about prospects for political ambition and political engagement of these young people later in life. And so why is this the case? Throughout the course of the book, we make an argument that there are three broad factors, all of which are linked to the current political arena, that account for this broad level of disinterest in running for office. So the first has to do with the way that politics plays out in contemporary American families. I think the easiest way to just summarize this point is to tell you about one of the interviews we conducted with Tatiana. We asked her, did your parents ever encourage you to follow politics or be interested in current events? And she said, no. And we asked, well, did they tell you that it was important to vote? And there, she said, yes, they did make it seem important. She had gone with them to vote a couple of times. But when we asked why politics and current events just weren't that important in her family, apart from voting when she was growing up, she said, what would we have talked about? A bunch of guys fighting with each other and not getting anything done? And she wasn't alone. This sentiment came through very broadly in the surveys. So this is just some, these are just some summary data about political engagement in young people's families. If you look at the top third of this table, these are the percentages of young people who said that politics occurred in their household in these ways. So for example, one out of every four young people said that their parents often talked about politics with their friends and family. One out of five said that they talked about politics at mealtime. Slightly smaller percentage said that their parents sometimes yelled at the TV because they were mad about politics. What this translates to mean is that 75 to 80% of young people lived in households where their parents didn't talk about politics with their friends or at meals or around the TV. When we asked people, well, do you speak, how often do you speak with your parents about politics? We again see only about 21 or 23% of people said that they talked about politics with at least one parent a few times a week. Strikingly, about half said that they talk about politics with their parents rarely or never. So political conversations are not happening in the household generally, and young people are not exposed to a lot of political content, even when their parents are engaged in discussions about current events. And then finally, we asked about political activities. In terms of going to vote with their parents, about a quarter reported having done that, but, and, and a bit more than a third watch election night coverage, but that's pretty much where it stops, only one in five share political stories through some social networking site. More than nine out of 10 had never attended any kind of political event with their parents. So they're living in a political environment that just does not, they're living in an environment that does not prioritize politics in any way. And this, is, this emerges also in their family discussions. We asked them what they talk about. David, a college freshman said, in my family, we just don't talk about political stuff that much. Washington and politicians are terrible and a million miles away. We just should not bother with it. 
a high school junior told us they, her parents, never really wanted to talk about government stuff. And when it did come up, they were always saying that the system was too broken to pay attention to. Or another college senior told us, we have big debates at dinner about important issues, but we often end up condemning the whole government system for being so ridiculous. So even when politics does emerge and there is some kind of political content within the household, it's often very negative and often reinforces this idea that politics is not a way to achieve success or to get anything done and to accomplish goals for improving the world. It's not that surprising, therefore, that young people do not report much encouragement to run for office. When we ask, did a family member ever suggest that you run or that this is something that you should think about later in life, 26% said that a parent had at least mentioned it, but these were not regular mentionings, right? These were not sustained efforts to encourage their children to run for office. In fact, if you look at the bottom half of this slide, only 5% said that their mother suggested it a number of times, only 6% said that their father did. And only 2% of the people that we surveyed and interviewed had two parents who simultaneously encouraged them to run for office multiple times. When we ask young people what they think their parents would want them to be when they grow up, this lack of encouragement is seen in the young people's perceptions of their parents' preferences. So the dark lines are what they perceive to be their father's preference for them. The gray lines, the lighter ones, are their mother's preference. And what we see are that, in general, young people think that their parents would prefer that they go into business or teaching, um, or even, in some cases, being a professional athlete. Member of Congress fares fourth out of fifth, um, ahead only of member of the clergy. When we asked them in the interviews, how do you think your parents would feel about you being in Congress someday, the story was similar. My parents just wouldn't want that for me. They would want me to do something that would make me happy, right? The notion here being that running for office and being an elected official could certainly never bring joy or happiness to their children. My dad knows a lot about people in Congress and he doesn't like them. I don't think he'd be pleased because he didn't raise me to be like them. Or a high school sophomore who said, my mom would probably be fine with it, but I'm sure if she could choose, she'd want me to be something else. She knows I can do more than that. So any notions of thinking that their parents would view politics as a noble profession just don't register or resonate with today's young people. Uh, this is particularly interesting. We broke these data down by sex um, just to see if young women and men were equally likely to receive encouragement to run from their parents. And here we do see gender gaps where men are significantly more likely than women to report that somebody in their family, a parent or another family member, encouraged them to run for office. Women are also a little bit more likely than men to say that their parents, both mothers and fathers, would prefer that they not have a political career. And while these gender differences are important for our purposes today, what really we want to hit home is that 89% of these people across the board are not interested in running for office. Before I turn it over to Richard, I just want to conclude by linking these family experiences to political ambition. We know that young people don't talk about politics with their parents, that they don't engage in political activities with their parents, that most of their parents don't suggest that they run for office. But the few that do are far more likely to express interest in running for office. So for example, if we look at the top two bars on this slide, here we broke the sample down into people who talk with their parents a few, at least a few times a week about politics. If they talk about politics with their parents a few times a week, 22% of them are interested in running for office. Among those who don't talk about politics with their parents, only 6% have considered running for office. The same thing is true with encouragement for a candidacy. So 27% of those whose mothers encouraged them to run and 28% of those whose fathers encouraged them to run have considered running for office. Only 5% of those whose mothers haven't and 6% of those whose fathers haven't have considered running. So what this means is that a politically charged household and political interest by parents, political discussions in the household, really can generate political ambition among young people. Even if the content about politics is generally negative, chances are some of these discussions are positive. The problem, of course, is that the overwhelming majority of these young people don't have these experiences. So they don't find themselves in an environment where they're accruing the ingredients that would help them ultimately at least think about running for office.
Okay. So thank you, Jen. Now I'm going to turn to sort of our second and third explanations and then talk about maybe what we could even do about this. Um, so, you know, Jen discussed how, you know, the family is often the bedrock of where people get their political values and beliefs. That's where it starts. But the literature on sort of how other people acquire their beliefs beyond the family focus on sort of school, media, peers, the popular culture surrounding you. So we'll just sort of start this explanation. So we're going to look at school, media, and peers, but look, but look at the popular culture surrounding young people today about politics. So here's a Jimmy Fallon quote right after the 2012 elections. Today, the Senate swore in a record 20 female senators. Yep. The women said they're very excited and look forward to proving they can accomplish just as little as male senators. Uh, Jay Leno, a little later, a top geneticist, geneticist at Stanford says, human intelligence is declining. You know what that means? We're seeing Congress at its smartest and most effective right now. And finally, uh, a quote, uh, uh, you know, very popular among young people, John Stewart, I'm not saying this Congress is bad at its job. I'm just saying that this Congress is equivalent to a skunk with its head in a jar of Skippy peanut butter. I mean, that just con typically when you, I mean, this was just a simple smattering of looking up sort of late night comedians about how politics is sort of conceived in ways that young people would many, in many ways come to, come to look at it. So let's turn first to school. Now here we've broken our sample down by high school and college. We're looking at political exposure in school, political discussion uh, in classes, and interests among classmates, politics among classmates. So there's big differences about high, in high school and college. But if we look at the high school sample, you can see that you know roughly only a quarter of students in high school, and maybe the mean average age is between 15 and 16, have taken a government class. So only a quarter of our students are sort of exposed in any systematic way to government by the time they're 15 or 16. Uh, fewer have seen a politician as a guest speaker, and even fewer have sort of contacted a political leader as a class assignment. When you go to political discussion in classes in high school, uh, almost two thirds of the classes, you know, rarely or only a couple times a month, ever bring up politics. So it's just not omnipresent, and we're not conditioning young people in high school to think politics is something that should be followed, kept track of, and what's going on. And then when you get mo even perhaps more devastating, interest among politics among classmates, again, two-thirds have no interest or very little interest. Uh, now, when you get to college, it sort of ramps up a bit, but it is hard in college to avoid, to avoid politics. You're going to, in many states, you're forced to take a government class as part of the curriculum, uh, political rallies are sometimes occurring on campus. You see it go up a lot. But school, if you're going to experience politics anywhere, it's going to be in school. And our numbers suggest it's only happening at a moderate level. Okay. Uh, let's talk about, next we ask young people, well, when you're with your friends, your peers are very important to you. If your peers are following politics, you might be more likely to follow politics. When you're with your friends, what are topics that you regularly discuss? So, of course, school's at the top of that list, your teachers, your assignments, you know, you move down music, sort of food, what you're going to eat, TV shows. Well, not surprisingly, what's at the bottom? Politics, at the very bottom of this list of what things you like to talk about or regularly talk about with your friends. We might gain some optimism by noting that current events is sort of has 35%, but young people, when we ask them what they meant by current events, they're really talking often about entertainment news, they're talking about weather, sports, they're thinking of those as current events, they're not thinking about what's happening in North Korea's current events. So politics really is sort of at the bottom of the list of topics of conversation. Again, now, when we use our quotes, your quotes really flesh out what this data suggests, you sort of get a sense of what young people think about politics. Here we spoke to Rebecca, a high school sophomore. Most of my friends don't care about things outside the texting world. We don't care about politics, we focus on other things, you know, and sort of young people just not focusing, that's not important to them. Ashley, a college senior, who you might even like to bring up politics, she, she told us, if I bring up anything more specific than a simple political fact, like, hey, Obama won the election, my friends are like, I don't follow. And then that makes me want to tell them this is our country and they should care, but then they'll think I'm being antagonistic, so I don't even bother, I don't bring it up. And finally, sort of why young people often don't follow the news, and we'll get to this a bit more, political news a bit, the government isn't effective, it's depressing to follow, so we don't, Mary, a college junior, told us. So when you talk about it, it's like politics is sort of a downer to be a subject among your friends. You know, now, of course, we know the digital generation is, you know, on, on, online all the time. So we ask them, when you're online, you know, are you using this incredible invention of the Internet and social media to sort of seek out information about the world, political information? And again, what websites you regularly visit on a daily basis or every other day? As we might, as we might guess, social networking, music, and YouTube videos at the top. Again, come down near the bottom, going on a political website where you might gain some political news. Only one in four students are doing that on any regular basis. Yeah. So, 
Um, now, as Jen showed with the family, we know that doing these things really facilitates and encourages political ambition in students. So all of these early socializing experiences where students aren't being exposed to politics, their families and teachers aren't encouraging, really matter. So again, we did the same thing as with the family slide Jen showed you a moment ago. Uh, if you took a political science or government class at school, you're twice as likely to think that you might want to run for office someday. We move down this list. If you talk about politics with friends, it's at least weekly, it comes up a little bit you're more than five times more likely to demonstrate political ambition. So, but what's happening, of course, our young people are not living in political environments. A little bit at school, less uh, among peers, and not much when they're seeking out their own media, okay? So now I'm gonna move to explanation three, and in many ways, this is sort of the, the heart of the argument here. Uh, you know, when you think about our young people, you know, our samples, 35 to 13 to 25 years of age, you know, the average age is maybe 19 or 20. That means their entire sort of political life from birth begins with Newt Gingrich in 1994 to now. Uh, and, you know, that is, as, and, and with the media sort of the way it works now, with round-the-clock media, both on the Internet and in cable news, they just learn a lot more about very negative things about politicians. So, you know, here's a sort of a who's who of sort of uh, corruption of the last five or ten years. Uh, they know, they, they know my, many of these names, like Anthony Weiner, or John Edwards, or Doug... Um, Chris Christie, they can't tell you that much about sort of the key policies being debated. So politics begins to be seen through the, this lens of very sort of negative politicians who get so much media coverage. So moving on, we asked them, like, what attributes do you see in political figures? Yeah, so we gave them a list of positive attributes. Um, for instance, only one in five young people thinks, think politicians or elected officials are smart and hardworking. Uh, le almost less than one in seven, just barely a little less than one in seven, think they're interested in wanting to help people. I mean, those are incredibly low numbers when you're, you know, in an ideal world, we're hoping our democratic leaders, that is their, their goal is to help people. Uh, moving on to negative attributes. So these, these double and triple, you know, uh, four in 10, more than four in 10 think they're just dishonest. And these are, you know, check off dishonest. Again, now, this is in our fifth chapter in the book. And this is where the, the quotes were asked them in open-ended questions. We weren't leading them or baiting them. Uh, you know, what do you think of political leaders? What do you think of members of Congress? Uh, and so quotes sort of broke down into three ways. Uh, they're self-interested, they're dishonest, these were lying a lot, and they're corrupt. But their corruption has some nuance in it. So like here's a sample quote from Juan, a college junior we spoke, who, spoke with, exhibiting kind of self-interest. Congress is filled with old men who are getting very little done. They're just self-interested incumbents who are constantly worried about re-election. Very common thing. Self-interest. They're in it for themselves. They only want to help themselves. Uh, Derek, a high school junior, this is a typical sort of quote we heard about sort of lying. Politicians have to lie all the time. This is what politicians do. I think everyone who runs an election is a lying sack of shit. Oh, is this HBO? Can I say that? A lying sack of shit. Politicians just suck. Very common. That that's just, your, oh, you have a reflexive horror about politicians. They lie, 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 lie all the time. And finally, many of them said, like Angelica, uh, our college sophomore, they start out effective, but then they change. They probably had good intentions at the beginning, but the system feeds their egos. It makes them do bad things. Many of them have said this sentiment. Many you know, people wanted to do good, but you can't do good in this broken system like we have. So you know, our, you just, these sentiments are repeated over and over by our young people about what they think of political leaders. Now, you know, ultimately, we'd ask them about five positive traits and whether they thought politicians had those. Now, not very many thought they had all five, but as you move along this sort of graph here, from the bottom axis is they thought politicians had one positive trait, two, three, four, five. As you move across that, if you're more positive about political leaders, you're more ambitious. That's your ambition moving up. So what that suggests to us, if, if young people had political leaders who were heroes to them, who were people they looked up to or thought they were doing a great job or really helping serve the community, it would actually matter quite a bit in terms of sort of what, how, how, how the political system's influencing ambition. So those are our three reasons, right? The family structure is not providing lots of political guidance and encouragement. Uh, the networks and universes that young people are in, their family, their, their, I mean, their school, their peer networks, the media is providing little support for politics. And, and the political figures themselves, when you look out there, you know, and the way it's presented them is not inspiring. Now, in, the, in the, our final chapter of the book, we do try to provide some basis for, well, where can we go from here? People have been talking about for years, decades, really, how young people aren't particularly interested in politics and what can we do about this. This is an older, old problem. We think it's perhaps the worst it's ever been, and nobody's really looked at ambition to run for office before. 
So we try to come up with five what we think are kind of fresh ideas about how to maybe inspire future generations or even this generation to get involved in politics. I'll go over these very quickly and then we're going to sort of, I'll summarize and throw it out to questions shortly. Um, you know, we have major initiatives in this country or in this, you know, we've had the Peace Corps, let's send people around the world to sort of help in developing countries. We have Teach for America, major initiatives to have people teaching in sort of difficult areas. Uh, we need something like a You Lead initiative, where we actually think it's a valuable thing to do to groom young people to run for public service. There are a few smaller organizations out there right now, but we would like something that's sort of national and large. Just like, say, running for office, that's a fantastic career goal. That's something you should want to do in your life, possibly, to be somebody who contributes in that way. Um, our second one, in a completely different vein, you know, we have to meet young people where they are in the digital age. Um, you know, the average high school and college student plays 14 hours of video games a day. I mean, that's a lot of time. That's averaging two hours a day. That's a lot of their leisure time. And for some, it's much more. Um, but if you go out and look at the range of, you know, sort of games that are available, we're sort of imagining games that actually make politics exciting, interesting, high-level graphics, like the challenge of passing a policy, of getting elected, at least to put it in their consciousness from a young age. that This is something you can do. This is something you should spend time in, trying to meet them where they are right now. Uh, third, and this has been suggested before, but this, this, this could be very transformative. Right now, somebody can be admitted to college, our best universities, you know, and not know who the vice president is, not know which party controls the House of Representatives, not know, could not be able to name three or four issues that our government's debating. And that's perfectly fine for admissions to college, right? So we're sort of advocating in some way that colleges should make part of their admissions process the, the notion that to be an engaged citizen, to be an engaged citizen in democracy, you need to know something. As part of the SAT test of uh, maybe a current events section, do they have to demonstrate sort of capacity in this way? We think everybody should go to college. We think, you know, part of going to college is learning to become an engaged citizen. So if we could really make that part of the test or part of the admissions to college, it's going to have high motivating factors, right, for people, sort of whether they want to go to college or not. Finally, I know fourth out of our fifth suggestions, uh, something like a Go Run app. You know, there are over 500,000 elected positions in the U.S., you know, down from, you know, village counselor up to the president of the United States. Uh, if you're a young person or any person just sort of sitting at your, at, at your home and you're wondering like, you know, I want to get involved. I want to start off in local politics. There's nowhere that you can go to sort of type in to look up easily what offices are there that serve in your area. We're imagining the development of uh, an application that could be used anywhere where you could simply type in your address and it would tell you from, you know, uh, you know, animal control at the bottom, elected dog catcher, all the way up to president. Who are all the people that represent you? How do you run for those positions? When is the next election? What, is the, what are the responsibilities of that position? This could become something used in, in middle school class, high school classes. This is how you get involved. By having 500,000 positions, we know that you know, we are, the design of our government expects many, many young people to get involved. And finally, one we think is perhaps most, perhaps very interesting for Emerge, uh, college programs targeted you know, young women. Although very few young people, men, women, black, white, you know, Republican, Democrat, are very interested in running for office, we do notice, and this is our age range of our sample from 13 to 25, that when you get to college, a large gender gap opens up between men and women. And it's not that really there in high school uh, so much, right? Men and women are kind of equally likely to say, or not very likely to say they're interested in running for office. But when you get to college, women sort of stay at the same level or move up a little bit, but men go up dramatically saying, I might like to run for office someday. So something is happening in this transition from college, and we could speculate about it in question and answer. It's sort of, some, that's where the big gender gap and ambition that we've uncovered in other work about sort of professionals who might think of running for office begins to emerge. So finally, just to step back a minute, what are our conclusions? The bad news. 89% of our young people have pretty much written off the idea of running for office. Uh, most families do not prioritize politics and they talk about it in conversations. You know, the conversations are often incredibly negative, right? The government appears as something that's pretty, pretty horrendous. Uh, at school with friends and peers and to the media, young people avoid exposure to politics. They see little uh, and here, and what they do see tends to be negative and divisive, and they don't really want to get involved. Um, and finally, as we just went over, politicians can be so turned off by pol I mean, young people are so turned off by politicians that it doesn't even occur to them that running for office is a good way to exhibit leadership.
Uh, the good news, and we've gone over this, there hasn't been, I you know, don't want to be depressing. Uh, young people, and this showed up in one of the slides, Jen, showed 70%, 77, almost 80% of them say they want to make their community and world a better place. There is high internal drive among young people to improve the world. So that exists. What we need to be able to do now is how do we transform that goal to sort of young people to actually make them see running for office, being a mayor, being a member of Congress, being a state legislator as a way to sort of do that, to bring about a better community. So I think we're going to leave it there and we're, we're excited to have your questions. Okay, thank you both very much. That was uh, amazing. Um, I'm looking forward to some more discussion on the, uh, on the things that we can do to turn this around. Um, I know that we have uh, a number of questions for you. Um, so we'll start with um, uh, Jessica wants to know, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase this because she asked several questions. Um, were there any racial gaps in the data that you collected? Um, and how are you defining politics for the purpose of your uh, research here? You want, I'll take the race question, Jen. You want to take the definition question? Sure. Okay. So, um, you know, as I said, uh, you know, young people across the board are not particularly interested in running for office, right? Regardless of what demographic group they come from. Uh, but we did find a significant race gap where African Americans are a little bit more significantly more likely interested in running for office in the future than whites. And the same with Latinos and Hispanics at a slightly lower level. And we seem to be able to trace this back to uh, admiration held for President Obama, because we did ask the young people what they thought about a lot of political leaders. And Obama has been a very inspirational figure for many young people of color. And he's actually made, it would appear, you know, that young people of color now are slightly more ambitious than whites to someday run for office. As far as the definition of politics is concerned, for our major contribution here, we're focused on political ambition and actually running for and seeking elective office. We understand that there are lots of other ways to affect change, working for NGOs, staging economic boycotts, working behind the scenes, but the reality is there are more than half a million elected offices and somebody, the best and the brightest, should be occupying them. And it's through those offices that policy and legislation are passed and enacted. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question was uh, from Christina. Christina asked, uh, was there a, a similar study done in the late 1990s? And if so, she's curious if the data has gotten worse or stayed the same. So as far as we know, this is the first national survey of young people's interest in running for office, where it's not just a broad question, but we can link that question to the reasons for it. There have been studies over the course of the last 40 years, though, that have stopped short of asking about interest in running for office, but have tracked young people's interest in politics, the conversations they've had with their parents about politics, the conversations they've had with their friends, their experiences at school. And we know that all of those things actually predict whether they're interested in running for office. When we compare our responses on those kinds of indicators to those from the past 40 years, things do seem to be at an all-time low. And although we don't have the data on political ambition over time, that would suggest to us that young people's ambition in running for office today <clears throat> is probably less than it was in the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. Okay, thank you. Dr. Fox, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, no. I mean, I, I, we, nobody, as Jen said, it doesn't appear that anybody's clearly asked this in depth and then been able to analyze in the same way. Anecdotally, when you talk to people, it feels like they're less likely to suggest to their kid, like from some of us who are older, hey, you should be president someday, that that doesn't come up as much. There really isn't data verifying that. But what Jen has said, lots of the other indicators seem to be, be there that this is as bad as we've been, at least since modern polling exists in terms of people having political discussions with their family or saying it's important to keep up on politics and current events. So we're sort of at, a, at maybe the worst period we've been since modern polling exists. Okay, thank you. Um, we have several questions here about money, and they're wondering uh, whether or not your research included any questions or if you got any feedback at all about the cost of running for office being prohibitive, or any, any questions or comments at all about money. 
So no, but I think it's important to keep in mind that for a lot of these respondents, this was the first time they had ever even given the notion of running for office any degree of thought whatsoever. And so their visceral reaction was not really linked to the specifics of a particular campaign or what it would be like for them to run. It was linked more to the broader electoral environment and how they find it an ineffective, inefficient way to bring about change. And so in a lot of ways, being worried about the mechanics of a campaign or public financing or any of the details involved in running, media scrutiny or going door to door or any of these kinds of activities happen further down the road. But they require that you not write off the notion of a future candidacy when you're 17. And so those are the kinds of issues that adults might think about or that college students that are very, very politically ambitious might consider. But for most of these students, it was a much broader overall assessment of the political arena. Yeah, like when you ask, for many of our young people, I think we estimate about 60% of them, you ask them, hey, uh, might you like to run for office someday? It's like their response is like, what? I, I, no one's ever asked me that before. We have a line in the book, it's like asking them, do you plan to go lawn bowling someday in the future? It's like something they've never thought about, right? Now, a, a group of them in the open-ended quote think that the government's very corrupt. So you could see traces of, oh, they're out for themselves, they just want to get rich, they want to get more money. They're not thinking maybe about the gross amounts of money moving into politics in certain contemporary elections. But there is a sense that by the what those who are following politics a little bit, that it's a very corrupt endeavor you know, of self-interested people. Okay, thank you. Um, there are another question, uh, or several questions here about demographics and race. Once again, if you have uh, specific information, I mean, you broke down the age ranges very well, but if there's any specific information on the demographics of your sample, and then whether or not their answers uh, were different depending upon race. So it's a national random sample that is representative of the US population. So the race differences break down the way the general population in the United States does, as do the gender differences, as do the, the gender breakdown, um, and generally um, economic breakdowns too, because they were selected um, through their parents and the family's income. Um, we, we have information on that. There are some small differences. As Richard mentioned, African Americans and Latinos are slightly more interested in running for office in the future because they're more likely to have positive assessments of at least one major politician. But to the extent that 89% of the sample overall is not interested in running for office, it's difficult to make a lot out of the smaller demographic differences that we uncover because they're still so rare. Um, and, and so the focus of the book is uh, more about averages but with the exception of that one race difference and the assessments of politicians, the way the other explanations break down are pretty consistent across the races um, and across sex. Okay. Dr. Fox, you look like you're thinking about adding something. No, no, I don't have anything to add. I mean, uh, I mean, like when we interviewed some of the students and we identified them, some of the students of color definitely spoke very inspirationally about President Obama. Now, but the, the, the interviews are more anecdotal, but so it, it, it certainly would appear that his, his presence uh, has meant a lot to a, a number of, of <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Oh, one thing that I would add, a sort of indirect way that race plays a little bit of a role is children of Democratic parents were far more likely than children of Republican parents to say that their parents had encouraged them to run or to express interest in running. And so knowing that the overwhelming majority of African Americans are Democrats, it could indirectly be working through party as well. But again, we don't want to make too much of the party difference because even among Democrats, the numbers that are interested in running for office are still very, very low. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple of uh, kind of loaded questions here, and I'll, I'll let you take a crack at it. Well, I'm sure this is uh, uh, going to be uh, anecdotal at best, but Amanda is saying here, um, she writes, I am 23 and interested in running for office, but I think all politicians have to lie, and a lot of them are self-interested, awful people. How do I get over that perception? Is it worth it to run, or will my voice just be drowned out by all the terrible people out there? I feel like we actually interviewed her for the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard, do you wanna? Um, 
I, you know, we're social scientists and we're trying to document what we think is a very serious problem. Like that that's part of the crisis. Somebody like, did you say Amanda? I'm sorry, was it Amanda? Yes, uh, like, Amanda. Uh, p- people who have motivations to sort of be helpful and contribute to society. We want them to think about running for office and being a leader that you can in- enact incredible change as a state legislator, a mayor, even a city council person. Sort of write that off because the system seems so appalling is what we're really deeply concerned about. Um, and like, we're not naive enough to think that suddenly you know, politicians will just change or the system can change overnight. This is going to be a process possibly to sort of get us out of this partisan, ugly time we've been in. Although, you know, one might argue it's always been like that. So it's very hard to say, not to know what to say to her, to say, hey, I mean, we, we want the best and the brightest and most, you know, policy oriented and people who want to make changes running for office. That's an important thing to do. And then, you know, unfortunately, what happens when you get there is it's difficult to deal with the system and you just have to hold on to your values the best you can. But the other thing that I would note is that the kinds of examples that get highlighted by the news media are often highlighted because they're the most egregious, they're unusual, they're what's newsworthy. And so one of the findings throughout the book is that those people who are more ensconced in the minutia of politics, the ones who follow news all the time, the ones who do navigate these websites, the ones who really are political junkies, are just as likely as everybody else to see the negative aspects of politics. But they're also far more likely to see some examples of the positive. So if you're able to wade through the muck, you do come upon some pretty good stories and pretty good examples of how politicians can make a difference. And I think it's highlighting those kinds of examples that can send the signal that it's not all dysfunction. Um, You know, sometimes it's easy to forget that when on the nightly news, every opening story is what Congress didn't manage to do that day. But some bills do get passed and some laws do get enacted and we do have a functioning government. And I think it's important to highlight that and remember that. That's a great point. What happens is the national media and the national politics becomes a lens through which every young people experience and learn about politics. They don't really often know what's happening at city council or state legislatures or in the county commissioner's office. And there's lots of great works happening there. It's just not something you learn about. So looking beyond, like Jen said, getting by the mic, looking beyond the national spectacle of politics and going down to these other, you know, 500,000 positions down there, you're going to find people of, you know, with real goals and ambitions to improve their communities. It's just sometimes hard to see. Okay, thank you. Um, Here's another question, uh, and I, I don't know, maybe you're aware of some, some data on this, um, talking more in terms of uh, young people's views on public service in general. And uh, Gregory writes, um, what are your thoughts on the influence of sociological trends in the U.S. that tend to praise materialism, status, and denounce intellectualism and education? Do you think this impacts young people's view on public service? I would say uh, yes. I mean, we don't probe too deeply into that question that way, but we do ask them what their life values are. And being having a successful career in which we would gather, they, we mean, they, most of the mean by that is making an, enough money to live very well and to acquire things. That, you know, that is sort of the modern ideology today of our young people. And the notion of public service, that very phrase of public service seems to be sort of diminishing. So there's certainly something about what gets valued in U.S. society that comes across at the broad level in our study, but you know, I probably can't go as far into it as you would like. Okay, and uh, I think you kind of answered this a little bit in your presentation, but if uh, just to delve a little bit further, the question was asked, do you believe that differences in class backgrounds affect young people's interest in running for, for office? So we did not find uh, economic differences when we asked about the, we had data on the household incomes from the young people's parents. And when we broke the results down by economic background, we did not uncover any differences. Again, I think it's important to remember that we're asking about, have you ever considered or would you think about running for any public office at any point in the future? So in a lot of ways, it's this broad amorphous question Um, You know, a lot of the studies of actual potential candidates that are interested in running for office adults, for example, find that people of higher socioeconomic status are actually a little bit less interested in running because it would often involve a pay cut. But, you know, these are not young people that are thinking about it that way. They probably don't even know that. Okay. 
And in your presentation, you discussed uh, a little bit that there was a that uh, it was pretty much the same across the board, uh, boys, girls, men, and women uh, that were not interested in pursuing uh, politics as a career. But especially at the college level, it seemed like um, the men were a little bit higher than the women. Uh, so my question to you would be, uh, if you, I'm sorry. Well, okay. So the question would be that. Uh, you say that both uh, men and women uh, had a sense of wanting to be engaged and wanting to make political change, but just didn't want to do it through the political process. Uh, for the women, do, was there any questioning or did you get any sense of that was just simply not a career choice for them or they just didn't see themselves as able to pursue that as an option? So this is the focus of the majority of our work, which is the gender gap in political ambition and understanding its origins. And the big difference we actually do find among the sample of young people is that once they get to college, the gender gap opens up and it opens up to such an extent that it's actually the same size among college students as it is among well-established professionals. And so we have a situation here where, um, we have a situation where you've got an overwhelming majority of young people who don't express interest in running for office, but once they hit a college campus, boys' ambition shoots up. They're far more likely to participate in the kinds of activities that propel interest in running for office. They're far more likely to um, navigate toward political science classes. Women pursue just as many leadership positions, but they don't navigate or gravitate toward politics. And the reasons that they don't on college campuses are very similar to the reasons that we find among adults. They're less likely to receive that encouragement. That's not the case among high school students. They're more likely to doubt their qualifications. That's not the case among high school students. And so the same kinds of barriers that keep women who are high ranked professionals from throwing their hats into the ring seem to be impediments even among 18 to 25 year olds. So clearly we have our, our work cut out for us. Um, there's a number of questions here about some of the uh, potential solutions or, or ways to make inroads into dealing with this problem. Um, I, I, just if you could expand a little bit more on your on your five uh, potential solutions. These were possibilities. These are not things that are actually in the making or in progress. Is that right? We're getting some questions about this. If anybody has a billion dollars and would like to help us make any of these things happen, we're more than willing to have that conversation. We but, don't need a full billion. We only need about 10 to 20 million, I think, though. We have a conversation for a couple of hundred thousand at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, these are the kinds of things that we think could ultimately inspire young people and bring about change. But as far as we know, um, at least the way that we describe them and the kind of broad um, solutions or possibilities that we're proposing are not currently underway. Let me, let me just focus on like the Go Run app or whatever it might get called. It is not that easy to figure out how to run for office in some places or how to find for how to run, run for parish you know, leader or ward leader if you're in a city somewhere. It is not clear that it is not held, that information is not held anywhere. Maybe the party has it, maybe the local city clerk's office has it, maybe the state clerk has it. We're imagining a world where you could pick up your cell phone, punch in your address, and you would have all this amazing information about how old you have to be to pursue these positions, what the responsibilities of these positions are, uh, you know, when the next election is for these, how do you how do you get on the ballot for these positions? But that could be transformative. That would be like you know, any, any high school, middle school government or history class could say like, you know, here's how you could get involved in the office someday. Just pull out your phone. Now that would be a major endeavor to create a database like that. But you know, some of these could be transformative. They're all just ideas that are sort of based on maybe other ideas we've read about and are sort of promoting. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for maybe just one other question. Um, there was one question here about, uh, about the, uh, when the kids were looking at or talking about candidates and how they mostly felt most of them were corrupt and they would have to lie and sort of cheat their way for self-interest if they chose to pursue that route. Was there any difference? I noticed that the slide that you put up were all men. Were, was there any other uh, offerings or uh, differences that you noted in, the ch in kids' perception between male and female politicians? 
Uh, we the only we asked specifically about four politicians. It was the 2012 election, so we asked about whether they found Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, Hillary Clinton, or Sarah Palin inspirational. Um, Barack Obama was through the roof uh, by far the most popular. Uh, Hillary Clinton, Sarah Palin, and Mitt Romney fared quite poorly. In the interviews with the students, they could have mentioned any politicians that they were interested in. We even had a question that said, well, are you inspired by anyone out there? And uh, Richard, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody offered a name. Not too many names were offered. <laughs> um, separate from the names that had been in the survey. Obama, right? so and, Romney, well, Obama, Obama and Romney had come up in the quotes because it was around or just after the election, but that was pretty much it. Um, so yeah, I mean, most of the male politicians were looking at, I mean, it sort of makes it a masculine world because all the politicians getting attention for being scandalous or corrupt tend to be men, right? I mean, Sarah Palin might have been joined that picture of, at this point, that uh, <laughs> collage of pictures. But I mean, so that is, so exper experiencing scandalous politics is also experience, makes it very masculine. You're experiencing men in politics also. But. Okay, thank you. So I would want to um, just point out to all of our participants, um, Drs. Fox and Lawless are the co-authors of several books. Uh, the first was It Takes a Candidate, Why Women Don't Run for Office. The second, It Still Takes a Candidate, Why Women Don't Run for Office. And now their newest uh, book, Running from Office, Why Young Americans Are Turned Off to Politics. I have Googled around. The book is available for purchase. I think it's only been out about two weeks three weeks yeah. published since it's been published. Um, so I want to thank our guests very much for all of your insight and sharing your research with us today. Uh, disturbing, but also a little bit uh, ready to roll up our sleeves and get to work and try to m make a difference here and do something uh, to kind of change this paradigm. So thank you everybody for participating. We, we hope you've enjoyed uh, uh, this presentation. Uh, doctors, if anybody has any further questions and wants to follow up with you elsewhere, is there somewhere they can do that? I'm happy to receive any email. Uh, my name uh, Richard.fox at lmu.edu. It's an easy one. Right, and it's just lawless at american.edu. Okay, fantastic. All right, that's all our time for today. I want to thank you all very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.